welcome everyone to the Friday afternoon service design takeaway and welcome to Spark. Spark is a design and innovation agency within VGSS and we exist to make positive change. We believe in the power of creativity and people centric design to explore new opportunities and navigate the unknown. And above all, we're here to make technology serve people better. So I'll introduce myself very briefly. I'm Kat, I'm a service designer at Spark. And next slide, please. These are our seven seasoned service designers and they have got some tasty nuggets of practical advice all about service design for you this afternoon. And together we'll be unboxing some of the myths, methods and mindsets of the discipline. And you'll leave this session with plenty of takeaways to experiment with your own practice. So what are the rules of the game? What are the rules of this session? Go to the next slide. Everyone will have five minutes. So there are seven people uh, presenting today and everyone will have five minutes to speak. And at three minutes, I will be showing these tasty peas, healthy three minutes into your talk. And then at four minutes, some chips, just, you know, yellow getting, getting towards the end. And then at five minutes, I'll be heating up that barbecue and people will have a few seconds to just wrap up what they're saying. And then we're gonna be cutting them off so that we can make sure we have everyone speaking and we have lots of time at the end for questions. So you can ask questions throughout the session. Uh, you can use the Q&A section within um, Zoom. So if you click on the Q&A, you'll be able to uh, ask any questions within there and then I'll curate them at the end and we'll come back together to answer the best ones. I use the potato emoji because it's the best emoji. Uh, I think everyone will agree. So enough from me, I really want to give everyone as much time as possible to go into their tasty, tasty nuggets. So first up, we have Anne Deer, and Anne is a design strategist with a knack for joining up things that seemingly have nothing in common. Her sparky superpower is starting way too many sentences with, I've had an idea. And her talk is start with why. Anne believes that as service designers, we help create the future, one service at a time. So we have the responsibility to reflect on the future and think about if that is the future we want to build and why we do what we do. So enough from me, on to Anne. Thanks Kat. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and to have a chance to reflect on my design takeaway. I had to, difficulty choosing which one. But these two books and the next slide, Start With Why and Find Your Why by Simon Sinek, had a profound influence on me. And if you haven't read them, I highly recommend that you order them today. They were my starting point and got me thinking about what I do, why I do it, and they're an early inspiration. As designers, researchers, developers, we all play a part in building the future. We are designing how people will interact with their banks, with the government, with the NHS, or how the NHS might work, but to name but a few projects that we're all working on. In a small way, but sometimes in a big way, we're designing the future. What we'll do will have an impact on people's life. We have a duty to think really long and hard about the future that we want to see from the point of view of the service, the organization, the wider social, economic, and political landscape, all the way to the impact on the planet. If we don't have a clear picture of what we're working toward, we might help build the wrong thing and only realize when we look back. So that's my question to you today. What is the future you want to see? Why do you do what you do? I personally have three steps. If you want to move on to the next slide or perhaps even two slides ahead. The first thing is that one. Yeah, the first thing I do is learn. Um, you'll see a bit later, Rob talks about the attributes of a good service designers. And one of the things he'll be pointing to is curiosity. We need to place our work in the bigger context of what we do. And for that, we need to cultivate curious minds from the very wide of philosophy, history, social science, religion, political and economic studies, health, sustainability, and culture and pa power, as Harriet will refer to later. To the, very, to the more specialist area. So for me, I have a particular interest on data and trauma, completely unrelated. 
but I bring them into my work. And the second step on the next slide is to reflect and decide. So look critically at what you've learned from, for example, philosophy, economy, and sustainability, and connect them to one another. Where do they overlap? Where are they in contradiction? Are there some red lines that are starting to emerge for you? And decide where you'll be directing your talent. So for example, some of the conversation I've had over the last few months and years is that we need to push sustainability issues as hard as we can, because, well, otherwise we'll do. And this is the right thing to do. But to make these changes happen, I need to be able to influence decision making. And that might mean learning more about business cases, even though it might not be my cup of tea, or joining forces with people who are experts at it. So using our critical mind, leading on to my step number three on the next slide. After learning and reflecting, the next step is to incorporate those decisions, appropriate them in a way, into our design practice. So for example, I believe that inclusion should be at the heart of everything we do. So that means I need to put inclusion first. It needs to be one of the first questions I ask in a kickoff meeting, and even early on in a proposal and in a tender if you're in a position to create them. And Emily will share some of those thoughts on this radically inclusive design idea. From previous projects, I have an awareness of trauma. So for example, if I'm designing a housing service, how do I bring this knowledge into my practice and, for example, spot possible signs of trauma in the person seeking housing and use that to alert me to a specific need which I need to bring back into the project? So learn from other disciplines, reflect and decide where I want to direct my talent and incorporate this into our design practice. I have a few more steps, but I'll run out of time, but like evaluating, sharing, holding yourself to account, choosing the right company that aligns with your own values and objective. And then you will say, but I'm only tiny grain of sand in the big sand, in the big machinery of the NHS or of the bank of the government. Well, perhaps, but you're also a lever that allows you to move things much bigger than you. So I'm a tiny grain of sand but I started a movement that saw the likes of 3, BT, Vodafone, O2 give free access to critical websites at the beginning of the pandemic. I just started it. Dozen of, dozens of people I don't even know rallied around and made it happen. They don't even know who I am, but each and every one of them made a difference. That's the big thing that we work on, the visible part of the iceberg, in, if you want. But this big thing is built on the seemingly tiny things. So that idea, was built on solid research insights that came out because the researcher earned the trust of the participants. And those came out because the research ops team took that extra bit of time to make sure that the recruitment was biased towards those who were particularly at risk of multiple deprivation. Each of them were a tiny cog in a big machine, but it overall made a big difference in pushing in the right direction. So you tell me, do you have a clear picture of the world you want to build? Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Anne. Really, really interesting. Great questions. So next up, we have Emily Herrick. Emily is a service designer with a passion for operate, operate, operationalizing by the people for the people. And her sparky superpower is harnessing creative tension. Her talk is entitled Designing Inclusive Spaces. Emily believes authentic co-creation can only happen when the people you are designing with feel safe, seen and trust in the design process. Give it up for Emily. Woo -woo. Thanks, Kat. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Herrick, as Kat mentioned. I use she, her pronouns. And for anyone that's visually impaired, I'm a white woman wearing clear glasses. I have red hair that's kind of in a messy bun situation today. And I'm about medium build. Um, as many of you can probably tell by my accent, I'm American. I'm one of uh, uh, Spark's first service design hires on the state side, and I'm based in New York City. Currently, um, today, I'm situated on land that was originally occupied by the Lenape people, which is a tribe um, that was here long before this land was colonized by European settlers and my descendants. I want to acknowledge this land and its ancestors, and then I hope that you all can look into who has occupied your land over time. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about 
what it means to facilitate inclusive co-design processes and why it's important. This is something that I've become tremendously passionate about in my career, designing public services primarily here in New York City. Um, many of you may be interested in or currently practicing design in a commercial sector, but increasingly design has become used to solve social problems like designing government services, streamlining access to public care, many things that we do here at Spark. Next slide, please. When talking about inclusive design, I often find myself putting the term radical in front of it. Um, I think of this as a way of acknowledging design's capitalistic roots. And it's important for us to remember that the principles and practices of design were designed for commercial businesses. Um, and they're in inherently customer centric. So what does this mean when you're working in and designing for the public space? Um, where often end users don't have the privilege of opting out of services that are poorly designed, where laws and policies add a level of complexity and where institutions may be seen as untrustworthy or even oppressive. As service designers, I believe that we have an opportunity and an additional responsibility to rethink our design processes so that they're inclusive, not just in pro the products we design, but in the way we convene and engage stakeholders along the way, and especially when we're designing with those that are traditionally on the margins. Um, the next slide, please. Inclusiveness you know, will look different in every context, um, but the way I see it, it's more than just facilitating a few research ses sessions with users, but it's about building processes that ensure diverse set of perspectives are meaningfully dri driving project decisions. It's helpful upfront when you're thinking about inclusiveness to educate yourself on the different types of diversity and what those different intersections of identity look like. It's followed closely by understanding how to design spaces that welcome different perspectives by acknowledging people's differences, modeling inclusive facilitation techniques, and establishing relationships built on collaboration over extraction. For me, inclusiveness doesn't start when you open up Miro to wireframe out that final solution, but it starts with your values, the organization you represent, how you design a project plan, the spaces you convene within, and all of the underlying implicit decisions that you make along the way. So to echo Anne's point, really the why of your practice. Um, next slide, please. Next, um, so how do you as a service designer conduct radically inclusive co-design spaces? Um, even if I have all the answers, I only have about two minutes left. So I'm gonna leave you with some guiding questions. Think about historical context. What are users' past relationships to existing problems and to the institutions that are in, intertwined in that problem? Think about where the power lies in the system and who usually makes those decisions. Ask yourself, how inclusive do I need to be to rebalance power in the system? What does it really look like to democratize decision-making so that users can really have a say? Think about the pace of your project. Give yourself enough time to reach the, those that are hard to find and to authentically bring them along in the process. And finally, remember uh, to prioritize relationships and think about where and how you can build trust because out of that trust, you will gain deeper insights and ultimately better products. Um, next slide, please. Last slide. So inclusive design, like all types of design is a practice. So what's yours? For me, I've been inspired by organizations like Creative Reaction Lab and their equity design practice, Sevilla and Greater Good Studio that are based in the Midwest here in the United States, the Design Justice Collective, BIPOC Design History and the Disabled List. And I've really learned a lot from people like Lauren Weinstein, Eric Liu, Tema Okonun, Sarah Fatalala and Kelly Ann McCurchin um, on their mo and her models of care. So I encourage you to think about inclusivity in your work. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. So on time. And I just wish it was an hour of your talk because it's so interesting. Um, maybe another time. Also, everyone is equally great. Sorry, everyone's great. So next up, we have Harriet Devet. Harriet is a small but mighty service designer with a passion for social justice. Her sparky superpower is starting a conversation with, did you know, and her talk is entitled, Why We Need to Stop Talking About Culture. 
it is a call to action for designers to stop talking about culture and start addressing structures of power instead. Give it all up for Harriet. Woo. Thanks guys, thanks for having me. Um, so today I wanna to talk about why I think we need to stop talking about culture and uh, instead start addressing structures of power. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Before we get into it, I just wanna quickly go through what, what do we mean by structures of power and what do we mean when we talk about culture? So structure of power is something that's an external factor that enables or inhibits the choices of individuals. Whereas a culture is the collective identities and memories developed by members of all social groups that make their collective social environments meaningful. Next slide, please. So like all great talks, I wanna start off with a story. And this story takes place in a favela in the Northeast of Brazil. So imagine a house where an expectant mother gives birth to her baby. And as is custom in this community, upon hearing the news, a man walks into a grocery store and buys the most expensive packet of Nestle's powdered milk that he can afford. He then walks through the streets to the mother's house with the powdered milk on display. And he shows this to the community as as a sign that he has become a father. And like most mothers in her community, this mother prefers to feed her newborn baby powdered formula over breast milk. However, a preference for milk powder is causing infant mortality to be artificially higher in this community. And the cost of buying powdered milk is putting families under unnecessary financial strain. But despite this, this mother continues to feed her infant the poorer quality milk. So there's efforts by NGOs to educate and encourage mothers to adopt breast milk as a healthier, cheaper option. But this is futile and mothers continue to buy the expensive formulas and put, putting their babies at risk. So what is it about this culture in the favela that binds mothers so strongly to this obviously dangerous practice? To understand that we need to go back to the 1960s where we see US sponsored aid programs introducing industrially processed powdered milk, oh no, go back to that slide, <laughs> into lower income countries under the guise of it being healthier and more nutritious than breast milk. Now, obviously we know that this isn't the case, but seeing this phenomena, Nestle spotted an opportunity and to this day it still dominates the powdered milk market across lower income countries today. So we fast forward back to our, mo our mother in the modern day favela and we begin to understand that actually the mother's choice to feed her baby with powdered milk is actually not a choice at all and that external factors are at play here. So not only are the perceptions of powdered milk as the better alternative um, persisting within this community, but women and children are also heavily dependent on men recognizing children as their own for fi financial security. So by purchasing the expensive powdered milk and parading through the community, a man demonstrates his paternity. And by feeding her children the powdered milk, a mother is relinquished from the stigma and prejudice of being a single mother. So this is why if we see a behavior or an attitude or a practice as a cultural trait, we can often fail to recognize the structures of power that actually enforce them. And we may in fact contribute to upholding harmful structures where people often have very little choice but to participate. Next slide, please. So like most terrible things in the world, the origins of culture as we know it today can be linked back to European colonial rule. And among these legacies of colonialism are many of the harmful structures that we still, we still see govern the world today. So these are things like white supremacy, patriarchy, racism, capitalism, and homophobia. And these terms really weren't weren't a thing before Europeans kind of stepped onto the scene. So next slide, please. So what you saw of the men on the previous slide and, and what they're actually guilty of is something that sociologists like to call um, symbolic violence. And this is the naturalization of inequalities as the way that things are or the way that things ought to be. And it removes the agency for change and upholds harmful structures of power. And as designers, I believe that we have a responsibility in ensuring that we don't unintentionally inflict symbolic violence on the users of services. Next slide, please. So an interesting example of this that I happened to be a part of was when I worked at a popular high street bank, which I will not name, but 
Within this team, I was asked to conduct a piece of research into the financial habits and systems of various groups in the UK. Now, one system that was of particular interest to the bank was something called the partner system. System. This is whereby people within the Afro-Caribbean community save and borrow communally outside of the official financial system. And this was seen as an opportunity by the bank to tap into traditionally hard to reach demographic. Now, due to the powers that be, fortunately, this opportunity was not pursued any further. But if it had, it would have enforced a system whose roots stem from a time when Afro-Caribbeans could legally be refused a loan or credit on the basis of their skin color. And much like the mothers in the favela, the partner system still persists today uh, among Afro-Caribbeans, despite them being now officially, quote unquote, financially included. So while it's important for designers to drive change and innovation for a better future, I also believe that it's our duty as human-centered designers to have a grounded understanding of the historical origins of structures that uphold inequality so that we can actively change them. And on that note, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed my talk. Thank you, Harriet. Um, I'll let you get away with a bit longer there because uh, some other people saved you some time. So next up, we have Kerry Hughes. And Kerry is on a mission to make things better by employing human-centered design and a design thinking approaches. And her sparky superpower is listening. I have commented on uh, Kerry's great listening ability and she just asked if I was making fun of her ears, which I probably was, probably wasn't. Uh, and her talk is entitled Once More with Feeling the role of emotions in service design and how to use them in as is and to be design. Give it up for Kerry. Hi, okay. I hope everyone's doing all right on this lovely Friday. So I'm, I'm gonna bring it down a level and talk about something we're all very familiar with, emotions, and particularly the role of emotion in service design. Next slide, please. So not too many years ago, are we going on to the next slide? Yes, good. So not too many years ago, talking about emotions in the world of business was considered fluff, a sure way to not be taken seriously. It was all about data, big data, small data, metrics, ROI. But humans are emotional. So research shows that 80% of an individual's life is consumed by emotions. So thankfully, things have changed and emotions are back on the table. But why? So advancements in science um, mean that we now understand way more about the brain and about how emotion and cognition are intertwined. Uh, the emergence of behavioral economics has given emotions a scientific label and revealed we are anything but rational in our decision making. And if science and economics are embracing emotions, then it's a green light to businesses, governments, health services alike. Next slide, please. So, in service design, um, using design thinking or human-centered design approaches, the opportunities to surface emotions are plentiful, but I've got five minutes, so I'm just going to talk about two common tools. So firstly, let's talk customer journey mapping and capturing the as-is. So customer journey mapping is a really common tool used widely today, and it can be really powerful, but it often misses the mark uh, for the reasons that I've sort of outlined on the left there. I won't go through them, um, but uh, what does good look like? So as Emily spoke about in her presentation, number one, collaborate with customers um, or at the very least uh, validate with them. Next, you really need to capture that rational la uh, layer. So this is the bit that people are really quite good at. So what the customer is doing. But then comes the thinking and feeling, so the emotional layer. And it really, it really requires good facilitation to really ensure that you're getting the richness of that data. And then post analysis, you're understanding what are the subconscious uh, things, layers, what are the hidden messages in our journey um, that are bringing these feelings about. And then that psychological layer and that analysis of why, so applying the behavioral science or economics. So that's customer journey mapping. Next slide, please. So let's move on to the design phase and how we go about designing with emotion in mind. So one tool that you can use 
in your 2B design is the dramatic arc, also referred to as the boom, wow, 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 boom. Um, so this is a theatrical storytelling tool that lends itself well to service design. If you think James Bond movie, concert experience with intense highs, lull, quiet moments and everything in between. But the key is it's carefully constructed. So unfortunately, not every service design problem to solve is the next Bond movie. So how do we apply it to service design? Well, number one, base it on research. So this should be appropriate and based on what customers need and what they value. And then be intentional. Choose where to focus on the emotions. Figure out your booms and your wows. And remember, not every moment should be a boom or a wow. To be calm is not a negative. And remember, doing this is not manipulative or unethical. You know, sure, within retail, it can be seen as frivolous and a way to make us buy, but it can also be used to great positive effect. And there's a story of a guy called Doug Dietz that demonstrates this perfectly. So Doug is a principal designer at GE Healthcare. So he stood in a, in a theater um, in front of his new shiny MRI scanner, super proud. And he just happens to witness firsthand a seven year old patient and her concerned parents. The little girl is crying, terrified at the prospect of lying alone in the scanner. In fact, he later learns that about 80% of, of children have to be sedated. So he puts his empathy hat on, he sets about observing and understanding the emotions involved and has created experiences that play on the imagination of children to combat these fears. So children now choose a pirate, a jungle, a camping or an ocean adventure. Look it up, it's great. I've got the link there on the slide. And I think it's like 0, 0.0 something that now need to be sedated. So next slide, please. I'm gonna leave you um, with one of my favorite quotes. So this is by Maya Angelou. And she said, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Um, I really prefer the boom, wow, 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 boom as a uh, description of that. It's just far more fun to say. So next up we have, oh, sorry. Um, Ollie Lukey. And Ollie is passionate about adopting a human centered approach to improve services. And he's been working with public organizations for the past three years. And his superpower, his sparky superpower is building forts, which I think is a very important superpower, uh, one which we all use in our day to day lives. And his talk is entitled human centric lens to change management. Change is constant and necessary to adapt. This talk offers a perspective on human centric approaches to change and how we can help people on this change journey. Handing it over to Ollie. Thanks Kat. Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, my topic today is um, informed by, by the last project I've been working on where I was um, asked with some, some of my colleagues to help um, redesign a, a team structure for the organization. Um, so not something that I'm completely comfortable with, but it's a topic that I've been uh, increasingly interested in uh, because it's really related to service design to what we do. Uh, because in, in many, many situations where we are designing new services or product, uh, that has a great deal of impact on, on the people who are delivering those services. So they will have to change the way they work, um, potentially learn to deal with new systems and also adopt new behaviors. Um, and this can be quite difficult in large siloed organizations, like often in the public sector where uh, these organizations are sometimes risk adverse or, or where people may be experiencing change fatigue okay. because there's been a uh, different uh, change program uh, that happened in the past and that were not successful. So, uh, a central question that we are facing in our practice is how do we take people on that change journey and how do we make it easier for them to embrace that change and, and get excited about it. Um, so when I was preparing for, for this talk, I remember um, uh, a little metaphor 
that uh, I read in, in a book called Switch. And it's the metaphor of the rider on top of the elephant that uh, you might be quite familiar with. It's quite, it's quite, uh, it's quite a famous one. Uh, but if you don't know it, I, I, I find it's quite useful to talk about change. Um, and in the book, they talk about change in, in every scale, uh, personal change, organizational change, and also so, so on the society level. Um, and basically, as Kerry said, um, in psycho modern psychology has uh, proven that we, we've got different sides in our brain. So we've got the rational side and the emotional side. And what this little doodle show is that the, the elephant side is the emotional and that's the side that powers us whenever we try to accomplish something. Um, and our rational side can be equated to the rider on top of that elephant. And even though the rider seems to be uh, in control, um, his control is very precarious because he's so small compared to the elephant. And if the elephant doesn't actually want to move, uh, it's likely that it's going to win because it's so heavy. So what this metaphor reminds us of is that the key to effective change, any kind of change, is to get the elephant and the rider and the rider moving together, and and that means uh, talking to the heart and and the mind. So in the next slide, I just want to point you to a few questions uh, you might want to consider if in your project or even if in your life if you're facing resistance to change and. It could be, for example, uh, trying to hit the gym, which I'm trying to do every weekend, but I can't do it. Um, so talking to the, to the rider, talking to the mind, um, so you need to communicate a clear and compelling vision. Um, you need to explain to the, to, the, to the user or to the, the staff or the person who is going to have to change, why is the change needed? Is it because uh, it's going to save some money uh, public money? Is it going to save lives? Is it going to make the world safer, for example? So in the example here, the photograph show uh, the, the mountain of paper that used to be um, stored uh, for the practical driving test. Um, and all of these driving tests used to be kept for two years. And that's actually a lot of paper. Actually, it's been estimated to be approximately, approximately 8 million sheep a year paper that's a lot of trees um, and that's also a lot of money and hassle for the DVSA uh, the, the organization that conduct this test um, you also need to um, give um, reason of on a personal level what's in it for me and what we find on this driving examiner in average where um, gaining 30 minutes back of their time uh, and as you can see in the test center there's a cup of tea there's biscuit and that's probably a very good reason. Uh, certain minutes of your time every single day is actually something that uh, is really motivating. So that's for the rational and for, for um, the, the emotional, uh, you need to motivate people by tapping into the right emotion. So finding the feeling, um, you need to, to move people towards what, what it's going to move them. Uh, is it part of being some, part of something exciting? Is it about helping others, uh, feeling proud about one's job? And the chance with the staff in the public sector is that most of civil servants are very driven by purpose and, and doing the right thing. So there's a huge potential of, of energy here to, to tap into. Um, so what we've done here is we've assembled a group of early adopters who uh, were able to share their tips with, with their colleagues and that, that worked really well. Um, and finally, um, say so shaping the past. So once you've uh, communicated the vision and talked to the to the heart, it's also providing support. And often the main obstacle that we face are our own belief. So in many ways, removing this obstacle is through providing training and providing the right tool for people to help themselves. So just to conclude. Um, if you're interested in that metaphor, it's in the book Switch by the East Brother, but actually the actual uh, origin is in the Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt. And there's a very interesting book around change and belief. Uh, it's the one on the right, The Liminal Thinking by Dave Gray, and I really recommend it. It's, it's very good. Um, so yeah, what is this thing you'd like to change? Thank you.
thank you. I've definitely read all of those books, um, maybe. So <laughs> next up, we have Toby Marks. And Toby loves to design things, be they brands, services, or botanical paintings. And his sparky superpower is the unicycle. Just exceptional. And his talk is entitled The Tale of Two Perspectives. Two brands play a critical role in differentiating any service design project you work on. Give it up for Toby. Thank you, Kat. So as alluded, today is about two brands that should be considered in any design approach. There are many, many, many perspectives that have been alluded to uh, over the, the wonderful talks today, but I, I want to hone in on two. And to do that, I want to ask you to enter our shoes for a second. The next slide has an exercise on it. I'd like you to think about what happens now. It's been a long old time in lockdown. Everyone's hair has grown. Everyone wants to go out again. But suddenly there's no, there's no places to get your hair cut. So a project has come in for you to design the services for users to get their hair cut. And we've got two different brands. So the first brand that I want you to think about designing this service for is Her Majesty's government, uh, the public sector, not traditionally associated with haircuts, but what of it? This is your brief. So how are you going to approach this? How are you going to think about that? whole end-to-end -end service? How are you going to stitch in the initial why, the problem statement? Is it that people want to get their hair cut or is it something deeper? What's happened to them during lockdown, the experiences they've had and the expectations they have? How are you going to approach this whole research piece to design something specifically for the UK government? The next brand that has asked you to design this experience and this service is the Mandarin Oriental, so private sector. Pretty different in every single way. So how are you going to approach this? The sequences that people want to take to get their hair cut are going to have to show up in a very different manner for the Mandarin Oriental. So what's the before, during and after look like for this brand? If we were to put these two brands side by side, it could be said that the UK government is about transparency, about accessibility. The next slide will show that this is pretty much central to their brand, their purpose, to who they are, to what they deliver to the UK society. For them, it's really about accessibility and inclusivity so that people can really do less as they're navigating through their site. They want to strip out the complexity and simplify for as many different people from as many different backgrounds as possible. Mandarin Oriental is all about mystery, exclusivity. They want you to come once, maybe twice, and really remember it. They want to do more and go above and beyond. So these are two very different brands that although the steps should be similar, the expression of those steps has to be very different. So that's the first brand. The second brand and the second perspective we're gonna talk about has another case study. So well done, your work on the first exercise was uh, standout. The next slide talks about what we're gonna do when you've been offered a job by four different agencies. So the next slide will show you four different agencies that have offered you a job that I want you to consider to join, to take up more of these service design projects. The top left, agency one, part of their brand talks about we put people first because we're human, we're not robots. The human centricity, the subjective element of service design is central to their core aspect of who they are. Agency two, we help brands to move forward in technology and digital culture. They hinge in that intersubjective realm. They want to look into the morals, the ethics, the history, the culture, and, and devise a, um, a service based on those inputs. Agency three, we helped companies bridge design and psychology, behavioral science, in other words, to create better experiences for their customers. So they're sitting in that objective realm, using data 
from all sorts of different means, quant to create a better designed service for the users. And agency four sits in the interobjective realm, system thinking. Systems design helps us to consider the impact of our design on human behaviors, society, and environment. So four very different approaches. One, the human centricity. One, the interobjective systems thinking approach towards service design. Now, none of these are right, none of these are wrong. Uh, together, I think they actually create a very inclusive and integral approach towards design thinking. But who you work with is going to have a specific approach towards design. So the final slide talks about those two different perspectives. When you're asked to design a haircut, you've got to consider who it's for and how they want to make it distinct for their particular brand. You then want to think about the agency that you're working for and what their particular approach is. Do they want to start with loads of user in interviews for the human subject of nature, or do they want to stand back and do some causal loops diagramming and do a systems thinking approach to it? All of these inputs will create a vastly different service. And it's up to you to decide who you work for and which brands you take on. So have a, have a long think and think about which ones you want to work for and what type of service design you want to get involved with. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Really interesting perspective on perspectives. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, we will have time at the end of the session to answer them. And obviously we have seven incredible different perspectives um, in this session and lots of different specialties and lots of experience. So if you have any questions around service design, how to get into service design or any kind of practical questions that you have, um, or you just wanna know a little bit more about one person's talk, then go into the Q&A and type in your questions and we'll talk about them at the end, which is very soon after, last but not least, Rob Hurd. So Rob helps companies solve challenges through design thinking and lean strategy with the aim of, of innovating faster and building better products and services. And his superpower is hanging on in there. And his talk is entitled, So You Want to Be a Service Designer. He'll be sharing what skills and attributes you need to be a successful service designer and will make you stand out in the crowd. Let's give it up for Rob. Thank you, Kat, and uh, hello everyone and good afternoon. Um, so obviously as a service designer myself, I am somewhat biased in saying that it's a great career option. It's a versatile and hugely, hugely rewarding role and a discipline that is definitely increasing in popularity as organisations of all shapes and sizes recognise the need and benefit that we as service designers can bring to their business and operations. So in slide two, I want to just look at some of those attributes that, that make a good service designer. There are many, of course, and I've only had a chance to list a few here, but these are, I think, predominantly the main ones. But something I want to say before I go through that is, is as a service designer myself and having worked with many over the years, I've certainly noticed that the best ones tend to come from varied backgrounds and they don't all necessarily come from a UX career, as you might expect. In fact, I'd go say that the more varied your background, the, the, the potential that you have to bring to the role is far greater. So if you have exposure to different aspects of, of the organization and different aspects of process and design, the better you are at being an effective service designer. So back to the attributes. And so today I want to look at three in particular, and these are being a people person, seeing the big picture and operating as a leader and consensus builder. So we move on to slide three. It's all about being a people person. So by nature we are social creatures as service designers we we need to enjoy people and solving problems that inherently impact humans we care about putting people first in everything that we do our mantra of course is human-centered design so but we have to be aware of our biases though and as a service designer our job is to try and understand and have empathy for those we are seeking to help and we have to constantly remain curious with an unquenchable thirst for learning and asking the why questions just as Anne said at the very top of this this, this session so curiosity may well have caused a problem for a cat, but it will make of the service designer. And we must be humble as service designers. It's not our place to be brag or to be bash, uh, brash around what we're doing. Our role is to demonstrate a capability to solve problems, to influence and to design for change and improvement in systems, experiences, and ultimately people outcomes. So on slide four, we're now gonna look at what it means to be a big, big picture visionary and thinker. 
So we, we, we think on systems levels to understand the whole picture that's forming ahead of us. And we have to have that ability to see beyond the obvious and, and what is immediately in front of us and, and go much further. We get the connections between different situations and processes, and we're able to connect the dots between different stakeholders who may well have different needs. We have to see things through different lenses. So we think big, we see into the future, and we enjoy helping up, uh, people imagine new ways of working, finding new experiences, and to challenge the way that things have been and let the shackles of the status quo go. And if you're like me, you probably hate the saying, it's because it's always been done that way around here. So painting a picture of a new experience through artifacts such as blueprinting is what excites you. You, you like creating meaning and order from chaos or simplifying a complex customer journey. That's what we do again. And I've heard a saying about service designers, which is we are detail oriented, pragmatic improvisers. And I think that sums us up quite well. So the final thing here on this slide is not to say that, you know, we're only about detail thinking. We're also about implementation, as we've already heard. So it's important that we stay close to the projects as they go through that implementation phase. It's not, and it's not just about prototyping. We have to oversee and ensure what we've designed is being delivered and being delivered to the principles and the architecture that we have designed. So being part of that change agenda is vitally important. And in slide five, we're looking now at being a sort of a leader and consensus builder. So we've already said that we're, we're people orientated, and that means we need to be good communicators and able to engage people on many different levels. We are facilitators at heart, of course, and we're not the expert in the room. Our job is to help others find the right solutions to coach, to lead, and to bring everyone on that same journey. We're comfortable when the going is uncomfortable, and we will always remain calm and help to find a pathway. We'll engage folk, and we'll bring them in to the conversation. We'll listen and hear their voices, and we encourage and praise together. We always celebrate the team. We win hearts and minds through clear language and the use of the right visual and mental metaphors. And so storytelling is a huge part in what we do. And we'll use the tools to craft a compelling message about the experience and the outcomes that we're designing for and why the future will be better and the role that the whole team plays in getting us there. So on slide six, which is the final part of my, of my talk today, I'm talking about why are we all here? Well, it's because we care passionately about creating great human user experiences and making a difference and improving outcomes and ultimately helping to shape a new future. We're passionate about the benefits of service design thinking and we love what we do. And if you're still interested in becoming a service designer, and we certainly hope that you are, why don't you come talk with Spark as we'd love to meet you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. That's right, we've got loads of jobs and we wanna give them to you, uh, maybe. Um, if you are interested in joining Spark, uh, we do have some roles available. So if you want to go to our website, you can find out how to join us. So now it's a question time. If anyone has any questions, just drop them in the Q&A um, section and uh, we can go through them. We did have one, uh, which I will ask to all of our uh, Sparkies today. So when you face when you're faced with a difficult stakeholder, especially internally, any tips to make them your ally instead of an enemy? So I think this is a really interesting um, perspective, the question to ask, especially um, to Emily and Harriet, um, when you're doing difficult things with with power and inclusivity. So Emily, how how would you would you have any tips to make uh, your client your ally? I always find that if you have someone that's pushing back against, I think you have to first kind of understand what they're pushing it back against. Is it, and, and why? And what I tend to end up doing is bringing the client into the process and having them interface directly with the users as much as possible. Obviously in a facilitated session, obviously with me kind of brokering that relationship, but often when clients push back or internal, you know, people have issues with, moving ideas forward it's because they have preconceived notions about how a solution should be and they kind of have those assumptions and so if you have the ability to have the users directly show them why things should be different it often makes my job a lot easier because i'm not trying to translate but i can directly show kind of why we are doing things so that's that can also be facilitated you know if it's not directly in a research session by with the artifacts that you create with the you know the quotes and, and the materials that you show kind of the user's perspective but that often in my perspective really pushes away the pushback because you can help people really align on 
the, the shared go goal. I think Anne's talk around the why also is really important. Understanding the why at the very beginning and really maybe seeing maybe if people have two different whys might be also why that pushback is coming. So getting to that heart early on can really lead to you know less barriers down the road. Amazing, thanks. Yeah, Harriet, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I think um, I definitely agree with what Emily said. And I think one thing that I've found that actually has been, a, sorry, I have a puppy in the background who may squeak a ball, just to bear that in mind. Um, but I found that what, what kind of has worked in, in situations in, that I've been in the past would be to simply tell a story. You know, if you've uncovered something that is truly going to pull at someone's heartstrings, you know, make sure that you tell that story in the way that it was told to you. And, and it's something that a, a stakeholder, no matter how high up they are, they, they can't really, you know, argue with the experience of someone who's experiencing the problem that you're trying to solve. So I think storytelling is a really important skill to have as a service designer. Um, the last job I was in, we did a week long um, course on how to tell stories. So, you know, it's really, really important. Um, and I, I really urge everyone to kind of think of that the next time they, they meet an obstacle with a stakeholder. Thanks. Um, Anne, did you have anything to add to that around making people your ally, your clients? I think um, I would probably do like Emily, what is the why? What, where is the agenda playing? What is the unsaid in this relationship? Are they responded, for example, to a, a previous relation, you know, a previous project or previous relationship or power? I remember a project where one of the stakeholders was leaning back through two workshops, didn't say a word, and eventually she leaned forward and started participating. I thought, here, my job is done. And later on, she was like, we've seen so many of you come in and come out. I just have to wait long enough and you'll be out of here. Um, and she saw that, you know, the work we were doing and she, the, the, it was going to make a difference. And at that point she started, part so it was not participating. It was nothing that we had done necessarily. We had to earn a trust before, because of things that happened behind us. And to build, I think I would probably balance out the storytelling with the business case. Nobody can resist a good business case. So I think we need to be like the kings and queens of business cases so that we can bring about the change that we want to see bringing the users and how decisions are made. Amazing. But also, and, and there's a lot of, I think, building out on Emily, having a lot of respect for people. They're not an obstacle. They have a reason. They do the best they can. Um, so having that humility, going back on what Rob was saying, that humility of there is something above me that I'm not um, necessarily measuring or understanding and coming about it in quite a humble way. Amazing, thank you. Um, our next question is for all of you, but I'm going to ask Rob first. So um, how do you land your first service design job when most job openings require um, you to come with past project experience? So how would you do that, Rob, if you want others to come become service designers? Yeah, it's a question obviously that gets asked a lot of, about not just obviously service design, but lots of industries who demand so called experience in that field beforehand. And, and I think ministry, it depends, you know, where whereabouts you are in your career and what you know, and how far you've come and, and what other things you've done. But as I said, often it's a case of bringing other apps aspects of different types of roles to, to the fore and, and showing how they have either created a change or they've been obviously very or they've been people centric in that sense so if you can craft your story your own personal career story in terms of understanding design and human thinking human centric thinking and and where you've pulled what you've done into that model um you, you can then show the benefit that you, you've delivered so it, it, it's also you know building out a portfolio as well if you've got some examples from your previous roles and and, and, and sort of engagements that you can show people that you know you understand the elements of, of design and design thinking in particular and that you you can you know bring forward ex examples that it, it, you know definitely uh deal with certain aspects then that's going to be your, your first thing the other thing obviously is is hooking up with other service designers on on linkedin and others and just asking for advice and asking to you know build connections and networks going to meetups and the like um and just just kind of getting involved in the whole industry and the whole kind of uh service design community 
and offering your services up basically even if it's for, for free for to, to do certain things but but getting involved is, is the best way um because you know you can't necessarily force your way without you know that that kind of connections and but i think it's persevere as well because you will always find people who will want to talk to you and they will be interested in your background and yeah you know, certainly we would be you know you know you know reach out to any one of us uh, on linkedin or directly and we you know happily have a you know, have a conversation with you and and look over cvs and look over portfolios and you know give some guidance where we can uh, but it's it's I would say it's perseverance. That's why my superpower was hanging on in there because it's taken a while to get to this point because you get a lot of knockbacks, but definitely just keep going. But just make sure you align what you've done to sort of design thinking methodologies and, and outputs and outcomes so you can show that all the time. And, and then that will get you get you noticed ultimately. Nice, thank you. Um, my next question is for Ollie. Uh, so Ollie, how would you help a client see that it's difficult to apply service design to one part of a service rather than as a whole? Yeah, uh, that one is uh, quite complex uh, and it rings a bell. Um, yeah, I think that's um, the, the first thing really uh, for me is to, is to use a, a mix of empathy and curiosity. So it's trying to understand um, when, 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 the, the organization are, um, have, a, have a history of um, working and growing on top of different layers. So often the way that the project or the, I don't know if the assignment comes a certain way, it might be that because it's been funded by a particular um, part of the organization that doesn't necessarily want to be uh, working with another one. So it's, it's really this mix of curiosity, first of all, to go in and try to try to understand how um, how the organization work and who are the people that can unlock this, um, and so that that there's one 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 part of that, and the other part I guess is also to demonstrate how it could be different, demonstrate the need to to move into that to be space, uh, and the best way to do that is actually to try to get people to get involved into that solution, and to realize that there is a problem. Um, so co-design, uh, having people that work, that never work together to, uh, to exchange and talk together and, and, and build that, that common understanding, that thread uh, against the, the different things. So the service blueprint would be uh, probably the best, the best way to get started, but it might take a, a while before getting there. Um, so I think yeah, curiosity and empathy and, and just trying to understand that organization and history and coming as consultants, we might not know the, the whole story. So it's very difficult to, uh, to change things sometimes. So um, yeah, that would be my, my guess. But I guess a lot of people have different uh, advices to, uh, to bring as well. Thanks. Um, you have a hand up, Rob? I was just yeah, gonna- I, 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 would, I would flip it around and say, to some extent, I, I would I'd embrace that and go, okay, let's do that. Let's do it on part of a service, right? Let's let's treat it as a small experiment. Um, it's a prototype effectively. And and you you'd identify the, you know, the issues and the problems within that part of the service. And you just basically just slink shrink it down, but lean it up and, and embrace the opportunity to show you or show the client what can be done, even if it is only part of the service. But but with the caveat that that is there will be limitations because of that. Um, and you know we won't necessarily embrace the whole aspect of service design uh, because we, we're not embracing the whole the whole service, but we can certainly show movement and po positive approaches uh, that can be can be achieved and success that can be achieved even with part of it. So if they're that resistant, embrace it as an opportunity and and and, and to show right and and to show what could be done if, if it's scaled up. Great, thank you. I think our time is up, but I have one question. Last question, which is for Kerry and Toby, um, which is, uh, what are your top tips for driving innovative question solutions in highly restrictive circumstances, e.g. deep legislation, short timescales or conflicting agendas? What do you reckon, Kerry? Okay, so, um, yeah, so I've worked in financial services for the last five years, so I understand regulation and legislation and 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 how 
compromised things can become. I think there's two techniques that we've sort of used, I've used in co-creation sessions with customers and with sort of clients. And that's starting to use the old technique of find the brand that people are really into and then frame things in an ideation session in the kind of what, you know, if Carling made a, so, you know, with, with customers, we were looking at if John Lewis did a savings account, what would that look like? Or if you're pushing technolo technology thinking, if Apple were to design a banking app, what would it look like? What would the journey be like? So pushing people's thinking starts sort of where they are. And I always, um, and <laughs> this is what I do, and it, and it can be difficult, but I always start, I always go for what it should be like. So never compromise yourself and take people with you on that journey. Start with what good really, really looks like and then compromise from there. Because if you put the compromises in, you're never gonna get beyond that point. So start with what the absolute you know, right thing to do for the user or the customer or the colleague or whatever it is, start there and work backwards. It's kind of hard to build on that, thanks, Carrie. <laughs> so I wouldn't necessarily talk about the <clears throat> the actual idea per se once you've set up all the parameters to narrow down what the possible solutions or ideas could be the thing i've butted up against many times is actually selling it in you can have the most incredible idea or solution in the world but if someone is very reserved because they don't like your approach or they don't like the change that that's going to cause for their organization or the extra work that it's going to cause for them then you can meet a brick wall. So first understanding that person and their background and the reasons for or against and, and how to actually work correctly with them is, is pretty critical. But then I think real skill comes into actually selling them the breadcrumbs to allow them to come up with the idea for themselves. If someone's come up with their own idea. They've already bought into it It's their idea. And if you as a consultant can steer someone down that breadcrumb path and say, this is what we've learned, this is what we've learned, and this is something they really liked. So what do we do now? And they say, oh, this is this this would be quite fun to do. And you're like, I love it. And, and then you don't have to do any selling then, it's already sold. So that's the final thing I'd add. Thank you. Um, and that's our time up and um, all of the questions got them all in, apart from where are all the cheering emojis? They're in my heart and soul, just cheering to everyone uh, doing their talk today. It was super, super interesting. Um, one last thing to say is that we at Spark um, and BGSS are offering a free one day acceleration workshop as a prize draw within the Manchester uh, Digital Festival. Um, and I'll just paste the link here um, if you want to enter. Um, it's for people who have a business challenge that they haven't been able to overcome or um, if they're looking for a kind of innovative uh, specialist, basically, so how to work on an idea and make it a reality, um, all you have to do is to write a 100 word explanation of your idea or challenge, and we will score these in order to choose the winner. Um, when writing a description, please make us aware of your organization um, and what you'd like to achieve by winning this reward um, and how you think we can help. So if you just type in, then you can win this incredible whole day um, accelerator, which I think will be really, really great. So that's it from us, um, from your seven seasoned service designers. So thank you so much, everyone. And as uh, Rob mentioned, you can join us if you go to spark.io slash join us. Um, and you can be one of us and one of the incredible seven. There are far more many like us across Spark as well. These are just the, the top tier, obviously. Um, so yeah, thanks so much, everyone. And I'll um, hopefully see you all soon. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.